Welcome to session two on my class concerning humility. I want you to imagine the opening scene, if you've seen it, of the 2016 movie, The Magnificent Seven, it's the one with Denzel Washington, the remake of the classic Western. And in, in, in the classic kind of Western archetypes, the first scene sets up the conflict between the good guys and the bad guys. The bad guys are represented by an evil mining baron who owns a mine and is very wealthy, and he wants to buy up this whole town to mine all of their land as well. And then on the other side, you have these simple farmers who are just seeking to make a life out of their, through their hard work. And the baron offers them $25, just pennies, for what their land is actually worth. And then so you have in this opening scene, all of the, the farmers are meeting together in the church and they're arguing about the best way to respond to this mining baron. And in walks the baron. And along with him, lots of his, his henchmen with, with lots of guns and they circle the people in a threatening kind of way. And the henchman comes up to the front, he pushes the minister out of the way, and he makes this speech. And it's a speech that I want to really focus on because I thought it was really interesting. He outlines the deal. And in his hand, he has a jar of dirt. And he begins, he sets the jar down. Everyone's looking at it, kind of wondering, what's, what's the deal with the dirt? And he starts by talking about himself. And he says, I am an important person. I own land, I own mines. I am the biggest part of the economy of this whole region of California. When I die, people will know my name. In a hundred years from now, there'll be monuments to me and to all that I've created in this state. On the other hand, you are, and he grabs the jar, you are dirt, you are nothing, you're meaningless. He pours the dirt on the ground and says, all you're worth is $25, take it or leave it. So, the question that I want to explore today is, of course, we're not like evil barons, we, don't, we wouldn't treat people that way, but I think we have to say as modern people, when we think of dirt, we think of something which is undesirable which does not have any value whatsoever. And so when he makes this comparison, even though he's, it's so gross and so horrible, we understand what he's saying. And my point is, is dirt really meaningless? Because as we learned in our first lesson, lesson on the word humility, hopefully we were able to get a sense of how important the concept of humility is and the fact that the word humility comes from the word humus, which represents that top layer of topsoil or earth or dirt. And it comes directly from the second Genesis story of Adam and Eve, where God, the very first thing God does is create the earth, and then God creates the heavens, and then God scoops up the earth and makes a sculpture out of it, blows God's spirit into it, and creates human from humus. That's where it all comes. Humanity, human, or Adam or Adama in, in um, Hebrew, same meaning. It means basically earth man. So we have this idea of earth being special, being the means in which God creates us. And at the end of the story, after Adam and Eve have, have done what they, they were disobedient and they were kicked out of the garden, God reminds them for that from earth you were made and to earth you will return. So we generally, when we hear that, we think, well, God is saying that we're not important or that we're like earth. We modern people think we've lost our connection to the sacred kind of connection to the ground. Earth for us is just something that we try to sweep out of our houses. We try to make our bodies clean with, with the earth and the dirt gone. It's completely undesirable. And that's a problem for us if we are to really claim this image 
of humility and this idea of dirt. And my question for us today is, is, is there a way that dirt or earth can actually be a valuable meditative symbol that can help enhance our view of ourselves and our faith, etc. In terms of humility, we, we talked a lot last session about how incredibly important the concept is for our life of faith. Um, the opposite of humility, of course, we talked about God railing, and that was the number one thing, the num number one issue that God has with us throughout the Bible and how God is portrayed is pride, is the opposite of humility. Arrogance, that ego-driven sense that we don't need God, that we are strong in spirit, not poor in spirit. Um, of, of all the deadly sins, the very top one, the most dangerous one, the first one is pride. Pride is the first deadly sin. St. Augustine said, humility is the foundation of all of the other virtues. Hence, in the soul in which this virtue does not exist, there cannot be any other virtues except in mere appearance. It's the key to everything else. We talked about how humility is not the lowly worm syndrome of, of selling yourself short and always talking yourself down, but instead just having a clear-eyed view, an honest appraisal of yourself and your relationship with the world and others, and of course your relationship with God. Um, Doc Hammarskjöld said, humility is just as much the opposite of self-abasement as it is of self-exaltation. To be humble is not to make comparisons. Secure in its reality, the self is neither better nor worse, bigger nor smaller than anything in the universe. In a way, it's incredibly freeing. If we live our lives through ego, through this idea of I've got to have self-esteem, we develop that self-esteem by comparing ourselves to others. So do we have more, are we smarter, are we more beautiful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is a form of bondage, I would say. And what God is offering us and encouraging us to embrace is this idea of humus, humility. And so I would like to today explore what can ground teach us? Eugene Peterson has a really great quote. I love this quote. If we cultivate a lively sense of our origin and nurture a sense of continuity with it, who knows, we may also acquire humility. So when he talks about cultivating a lively sense of our origin, I think he's talking about a sense of what earth mud, what that whole image of a mud person is all about, and then nurturing a sense of continuity. So how can that enable a continuous relationship with God? This is an awareness of the mud. So as I said, I think our problem as modern people is that we, we have lost our connection to the earth. We live inside. Earth to us is dirt, it's something we keep out of our lives. But there are very few, but there are people on the earth who do live outside and who have maintained this kind of natural connection to the earth. That certainly the people, when, when the Genesis story was written, the people that those that, that gave birth to that story, the ancient Hebrews, and even Jesus all through his time, they had that connection. They had an intuitive sense of the power and the reliance that that, that their whole life really was reliant on the earth and what comes from the earth. I'm going to read you a, a wonderful quote by a poet. His name is Bob Randall, and he comes from an Aboriginal community in, in Australia. These are people who still have this sense of connection with dirt. The land grows up, grows all of us up. The land owns us. It's the ancient one, not us. We're the children who come and go, take what we need for a short time, and then pass it on to other children. This spacious land, our land, stretches from horizon to horizon. The clouds are the ceiling by day and the stars by night. So shrinking things down to what is mine, what I'm responsible for, 
to shrink this down to a little box of my stuff, my house, my car, etc. It is all so small in comparison to what is ours. And you are a part of this oursness. And you feel this very deeply. You feel good when you're in this space. It feels like you're living with family. When you include everything that's alive in that space, you're with family. Then you grow up knowing, believing, and accepting that these are all, all created life is your family. You can never feel alone in this place. That's what I'm talking about. That's the intuitive connection that ancient people had, the people of this story had with dirt. That's what we've lost. And what I'd like to try to rekindle in my lesson today is that very same connection. So the first thing that we need to do is puncture our arrogance. We think of ourselves as the top of the food chain, the masters of the universe, everything revolves around us. The whole world um, has, has us to thank <laughs> for all of the, the good things in the earth. And so I'd like to start with just some simple images on the board here. We'll start, if you think of this, when you look at this pyramid, this represents, each circle represents a group of all of the living organisms on earth. When you, when you count them all up, 90% are single cell organisms. Microbes, I'll refer to them. So only 10% of the total make up animals. The entire, think of all of the diversity and richness of the animal life and vegetation and plants in, on land and in the ocean. All of that, everything you can think of, that's only 10% of creation. 90% is this world that we can't see, that we're not even aware of but I would say is critical. That's not just me. We, we need to acknowledge that that 90% is the reason that we all can survive. Another way to puncture, I think, our arrogance would be to think of just one teaspoon of dirt. One teaspoon of humus contains 20 to 30,000 different species of bacteria. Just that tiny little teaspoon. 20 to 30,000 30, species. Within that same teaspoon, you have total about 1 million different fungi. You have 1 billion individual organisms back, that are bacteria. So if you were to do a scoop, like a handful scoop of earth, you would have in your hands more living organisms with exactly the same kind of DNA that you or I have. Living organisms, there are more living or organisms in that scoop of dirt than the total population, human population on earth, which is about say 7.8 billion people. There are more organisms in that tiny little scoop in one hand to give you a scope of the bigness of this and the smallness of us. So let's, let's do another thing which helps with the context. It's just the timeline, which is very human oriented. So if you think the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago, approximately, and Homo sapiens, first evidence we have of Homo sapiens are about 195,000 years. So compare 13.8 billion to just 195,000. So the existence of Homo sapiens on this planet is the tiniest little blip within the context of it. Or even, even if you go the sun, sun forming 4.6 billion years, the earth cooling about 4.5 billion years, Still, 4.5 billion in comparison to 195,000 years, tiniest little blip of 
time. So when we walk through this, this process, 4.2 billion years ago, we have the oceans. Most all of the earth was, was water, was oceans. Um, there's a really interesting story if you want to learn more about how we got water on earth, why of all of the planets in our solar system, earth is the one with water. Really interesting, but I don't have time to talk about that today. I'd encourage you to learn about that. 3.5 billion years ago are the example of the very first, oldest example that we have of the first life with DNA. These are single cell little microbes that I've been talking about here. Starting about 2.7 billion years ago, we have something called cyanobacteria that evolved into something we just the colloquial name for them is blue algae. And these single cell microbes floating on the top of the ocean consumed the toxic sulfur and ammonia and carbon dioxide that made up the air at that time. They consumed it and they released oxygen. So those tiny little blue uh, bits of blue algae, these microbes, are responsible over billions of years of creating our atmosphere, which sustains life. So a pretty huge accomplishment for these tiny little microbes to create all of the oxygen to get to enable life to, to grow. About 900 million years ago, we have multicellular life, life starts life starts to expand. We have fungi about 700 million years ago, about 530 million years ago, there's in the fossil record this idea of small little vertebrates. So we're now starting to have a bone structure as the as, as the evolution enables a larger beings. But still all life is in the water. About 500 million years ago is the time that experts believe that, that these living creatures, still a tiny percent of what's actually alive on the planet, but these living creatures started to explore getting out of the water onto land. Um, and so then we have after that life in the water as well as on land. About 485 million years ago, we have vegetation, plants, trees, etc., spreading widely across the land. We'll talk about how the earth and the bacteria in the earth enables that. Um, 235 million years ago, we have this, the beginning of what we call the Jurassic time of the time of the dinosaurs. Between 235 million to 65 and a half million years, that's the, that's the time period when we think of the dinosaurs dominating the earthly, and of course in the oceans too, life. During that time, there were five extinction events, big changes in climate. And so you think of these, the microbes, of course, surviving through all of that and just kind of shaking off the creatures, the larger creatures on the top part of creation, and then a whole new group re-emerging. And as I'm sure you've heard, the best theory we have for why the dinosaurs died out was a huge meteor comet strike on the Yucatan Peninsula about the year 65, 65 and a half million or so years ago that kind of cooled the planet and, and mammals, tiny little mammals were able to survive through that cataclysm but it killed off the dinosaurs. But again, it should cause us to pause to see our place our relatively tentative place in this creative order. Um, we have the first primates appearing about 55 million years, like think of lemurs, little tree creatures. Um, chimps and bonobos and gorillas earliest appear about eight to six million years ago. And then they think just roughly about maybe a million years after that, uh, five million years ago, this kind of splinter group off from chimps and gorillas that would lead to Homo sapiens start. The first documented erect walking chimp-like creature comes from about 1.6 million years ago. 
And from that, we have the Neanderthals and then the earliest Homo sapiens, as I said, 195,000. So I just tell you all of that to give you a full scope of the deep evolution of, of all of us coming from a single tiny cell microbe organisms as we evolve. So, another way to puncture and also to puncture our sense of ourselves being the center of the universe and also to, to better appreciate the, the role of the 90% of creation, we'll just, we'll just talk about photosynthesis, which is something that, that I'm sure you learned in elementary school but have perhaps forgotten. So I'm going to walk over here. Here we have soil and plant life growing from the soil. So what a green plant does is synthesize photons which come from the sun, the sun's energy, with carbon dioxide and water. And the plant synthesizes that and creates two things sugars, which is like the food, the energy for the plant, half of which goes to the part that we see above the ground to enable the plant to grow. The other half is sent down to the root system. The other thing that it creates is oxygen. So today, remember when I talked about the bacteria creating the oxygen for our atmosphere. Today, 10% still of the oxygen created is from those same bacteria in the ocean. The other 90% comes from plants on Earth, vital to our survival. So, the plant sends these sugars down to and through the roots embedded in the soil that we talked about. There are billions and trillions and multi, multi, multi trillions of bacteria, fungi, viruses, tiny microbes, single cell organisms that are drawn to this sugar. They consume the plant sugar and then their waste, they, they convert the sugar into the type of mineral that the plant needs to survive. So they have a symbiotic relationship. The, the fungi and bacteria consume, rely on what the plant offers in terms of the sugars, and then they in turn convert it to another form which the plant needs to survive. So, the, so they, they share and they're responsible for each other. And of course, all these single cell organisms are competing. So fungi and bacteria and viruses are, are constantly battling with each other for their own survival. And they evolve in the same natural selection way that, that we think of larger creatures do. But of course, there's way more in the earth than just that. There are worms that tunnel. Their waste is, creates nutrients for the plants food for other predators, there's arthropods that also feed on the bacteria and, and consume the decaying plants, which of course the bacteria do as well. Um, and also the bacteria, um, as they convert the sugars, they, they're, what they give back to the plant is this, they, they boost the immunity system of the plant to, to protect it from some of the other predators of the plant. We have nematodes and protozoa and insects, etc. There, there is a, a healthy, vibrant, amazing ecosystem that is in dirt. So we think of dirt as being dead, but in fact, dirt is teeming with life. Life that is the cradle for all of us larger creatures. Without that dirt and the magic that occurs, the sacredness of that process, no life above it would be possible. And in fact, the microbes depend on everything above and everything above depends on the microbes. That's the most important part that I want you to think about. 
So, why is this important? Um, I would say that once we have a clear idea of how our life is not the center of the universe, I think of like Copernicus who, who had the difficult task at his time to, to say no, all the planets don't revolve around the earth. It's like, it's like a changing of your world. Once you change your world and start thinking in a more humble way about the role of Homo sapiens in the larger ecosystem of the earth, I think it enables, it frees you up from this ego-driven sense of being master of the universe or even master of your own universe to an idea where you're, you're looking at yourself as living in harmony with this powerful force of not just all other creation that we see, all the other animals and plants, which are vitally important for us too, but also the microbial world that we don't see and we way too easily dismiss. Now, this time especially, it's difficult to talk about this, but I think it's also an opportunity because this virus that we are all trying to slow down the spread and are recognizing its danger, of course, it's difficult to say, well, microbes and viruses and fungi are actually good and responsible for creation and for our life, when in fact, some of them are quite, quite dangerous too. Um, but I think it's also an opportunity because it, it, it lets us know, it reminds us of how vulnerable we are and how powerful microbes can be. So, the story doesn't end there with soil, because of course, I'll bet you know this, um, our bodies themselves are completely covered and filled with microbes that are independent of our own personal DNA. We're talking about trillions of cells on our skin, in our mouth, our nose, our eyes, our throat, gut, our colon, they're all throughout the body, but those areas, I think they're concentrated most densely. These microbes on the body of all living creatures have evolved from the earliest times of our involvement. So we think of ourselves as being a separate, unique, special species. But in fact, just like the plants, we are living in total symbiotic harmony with the microbial world. We are dependent on the microbial world for our survival. So it brings up a, a highly philosophical, theological question, which, which perhaps we can explore in a later class. What does it mean really to be an individual? <laughs> Is it possible to be an individual when in fact, if you add up the, the trillions of cells, scientists think that there are perhaps three or four to one more, you could call it foreign, or more microbes that are not part of your DNA, that have their own unique DNA, separate symbiotic beings that are living on you or in you at all times. It, it's kind of mind-blowing. Also, we know that every 10 minutes we shed about one and a half million microbes. So think of a person in, in their interactions as they go through their day as having a cloud of microbes, which we are breathing in from others, from the food that we eat, from the environment that we live in, and then we are also sharing with all the people around us. So, and of course, when there's times of a pandemic, that's especially at the front of our, our, our minds. But that, of course, is happening all the time, and there's not a thing we can do about it. The really exciting thing, um, I certainly am no expert, but, but when you read just basic summary articles, you get a sense of how excited scientists are who study the genome of bacteria. Because there's only a tiny fraction as have actually been studied in depth. There's virtually all of the bacteria that are, are 
uh, surviving in the world we, we don't know anything about. And I read a couple articles that were really fascinating, which, which basically implied that the more we can learn about bacteria, and, and not so much about calling them good bacteria or bad bacteria, but defining illness as the, the, in terms of the relationship between different types of fungus or viruses or bacteria, the more we can learn about all these different types, the more it will revolutionize our way of staying healthy and our view of health. Um, and so again, it can, it offers the opportunity for a life-changing way of seeing yourself. Because these microbes, number one, the ones on our skin, think of it like armor. They're our first line of defense against a pathogen. And basically a pathogen is just a bad bacteria. So the purpose for these, these microbes on our skin consume parts of our body, but then they also are our armor to fight off pathogens for their own survival too. Of course, all of the microbes within our body help to digest the food and they take the food that they need, but then they also help us process that food so our body can better use it for energy. There's a lot of interesting research about how microbes also affect our state of mind and our wellness and our feelings of, of happiness and contentment. There's an incredible amount of research on the relationship between human DNA and the microbes which, which live side by side in a symbiotic relationship, which we virtually know nothing about. In our own extremely arrogant way, we think, well, we're ourselves, and we just discount the existence of all of these cells which are more numerous than our own cells. Again, hopefully all of these things, bringing back to, to what Peterson said at the beginning, that we can develop humility when we ponder all of these things, this sense of what is my origin and how can I develop a sense of continuity with it? And if we, instead of thinking of ourselves as unique, special, different, snowflake kinds of things, why not embrace being one part of this majestic, magical, sacred, creative world, which is filled with so much mystery that we can't fully understand, but we're only a tiny, tiny little part of. And so instead of trying to dominate it and trying to bend it to our will, which will ultimately always fail due to the nature of the weakness of our position in the creative order. Why not instead view it through humility and in a sense of being in harmony with all of creation around us? So just as in our faith, in, in our relationship with God, if we see God in creation and in each other, which I hope we do and we can foster and nurture, especially during this Lenten period, if we look at it through the eyes of humility and through the lessons of dirt, understanding our place and our role, it can be a very powerful way, a very powerful way of connecting to God through all of creation. And so that's my charge to you. How can I best make life decisions that are not harming the environment and harming my relationships with the people around me in my community, but in fact, deepening that sense of connection and harmony with all of life around me. And when we do that, we grow in our relationship with God and we engage in the dance to use that Trinit Trinitarian image that we that Dr. Rigby shared with us a couple weeks ago. So thank you very much for listening to my message and I look forward to next week's message and my time with you. Thank you.